Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, got a few more people in the waiting room, so I'm just going to let them in. There we go. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fourth and final webinar in our workplace literacy series. We've creatively titled it Evaluation uh, because that's exactly what we'll be talking about today, albeit in relation to workplace literacy. So this morning, uh, you're going to be hearing from me, and I'm Tamara Cottery, the Executive Director of Literacy Link South Central, which is uh, the regional literacy network that operates out of London and supports the six counties around. So just a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you're not speaking or trying to speak, it would be wonderful if you could uh, mute your microphone so that we can reduce any background noise. And also, if you're not able to use your mic for some reason, Andrea, I'm not sure if you ever got yours working, I, I hope so. Um, or if you're just a little bit on the shy side and you would prefer not to speak, but you have some things that you wanna contribute, please use the, the chat feature um, and let us know what you're thinking. So there will be opportunities to ask questions at the end of the webinar, but if you would like to ask a question earlier, then please put your question in the chat or raise your hand or, you know, if worse comes to worst, unmute yourself because I can't see everybody online right now uh, because I'm sharing my screen. So point is, we definitely want to hear from you. I'm sharing information today, but the conversation will be richer um, if we have more people sharing. Okay. So I'd like to begin with a, a, a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. So what's ado about workplace literacy? I'm sorry, I was an English major many, many years ago, and I still love that Shakespearean language. In other words, why the interest in workplace literacy now? Well, I don't think anybody on this call will be surprised that we are in a, a tight labor market. Uh, and by that, I mean, there are a lot more jobs and there are people to fill them. And what that means is that some employers are bringing on people who may have less than the desired level of skill. And that means that they may need to train some of those individuals and in foundational skills in ways that they never did before. So that's the interest from employers. And we've also heard employers in our area saying that retention is a real challenge. And definitely some employers right now are looking at workplace literacy or upgrading or professional development as a way to demonstrate to their current employees that they care and that they value them and they're wanting to increase that loyalty. Governments, not surprisingly, um, are putting more money behind workplace literacy. So not only uh, is this project, which is funded through the Skills Development Fund of the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development, investing in workplace literacy, but so too is the federal government because many people on this call may be joining because of our ministry's success in applying to the federal government for funding around workplace literacy. And I think even in the background, and maybe this is just me being Pollyanna, I think that increasingly across communities and beyond the workplace that there is in definitely recognition that skills matter. I mean, I've been trying to sing that song for a long, long time now, and I just feel like it's landing now in many different ways and across different audiences in ways that it didn't before. So I think for all of these reasons, workplace literacy is, is on the radar and maybe getting closer and closer to the bullseye. Okay, is workplace literacy right for you? Okay, so there are some things that you definitely wanna consider. I'm sure that workplace literacy isn't the only thing that your agency is involved in. It does require a certain amount of flexibility. Employers work just in time. You may have heard that expression before. Um, time is money for them and they want what they want when they want it. Okay, so you need to be flexible. 
also you need to have resources so we don't want to be naive and assume that workplace literacy is something that can be done off the side of your desk it isn't there may be several agencies in your community that are interested in going out and uh, addressing employers and meeting the needs of employers so there may even be some local competition in this regard you want to think about suitability you know, not only suitable for your program, but also the capital as suitability that literacy and basic skills programs operate within. If you're going out to a workplace, all those individuals are employed, right, which may have a negative impact on your suitability indicator. So it's something to keep in mind if you look at the overall picture. And last but not least, um, there might be a lot more opportunity out there for workplace literacy than we think there is. And as a regional network that was asked to do, uh, what was it, four organizational needs assessments this fiscal, um, all of our colleagues were asked to do the same. And for some regions in Ontario, the uptake has been absolutely incredible. Okay, so there can be a lot of opportunities, which is often a good thing, but it can also mean that you need to be ready, right, for people when they say yes. So we do assume that if you're sitting in on this webinar, you have decided that workplace literacy is probably right for you, which is awesome. Okay, so this is just an overview of the four training modules that we have developed. Okay, so some of you may have participated in all of them, or maybe this is the first one you're participating in. So it's just an overview that there are others that have gone before. The first webinar that we did was on marketing workplace literacy. The second was on assessment, which had a, a significant emphasis on organizational needs assessments. The third one was on training or actually delivering training in a workplace. And this final webinar is on evaluation. So while we're presenting these topics separately, the reality is that they often entwine with each other. There is a strong tie between today's module and evaluation and the second module on assessment. You can't build training if you don't know what you want participants to get out of it. And you won't know if they got what you wanted them to get out of it unless you think about how you're going to evaluate it. Okay, so you may have heard us discuss in other modules in the series types of workplace literacy programs. But before we jump into evaluation, I really wanted to set some context. We talk about workplace literacy programming sometimes, like everyone knows exactly what it is, but there might be people on, on this webinar who are interested but haven't yet done any workplace literacy. So you might be still trying to get your head around what that actually looks like. So when we think about types of workplace literacy programming, obviously there could be a very long list. And what I'm gonna show you on this slide and the next slide are some examples from an article that I reviewed on evaluating workplace literacy projects, just to show you how varied workplace literacy programming can be. Okay, so our first example of workplace literacy happened in an auto plant. It was a, a technical preparation course. I'd like you to pay attention to the frequency and the duration that these programs were offered at. Okay, so this first one, six weeks, seven hours a day really really intensive this same auto plan offered a ged prep course for six weeks at four hours a week so in your mind if you're thinking about targeted programming you know think about these numbers so 24 hours would be the length of the ged prep course this plan also offered english as a second language which we need to remember may also be an increasing option for lbs now that immigration is part of the ministry that funds us Okay, so they did it for six weeks at eight hours a week. So that's just one example. Second example is a women's prison uh, where there was training offered to staff on report writing for 13 weeks at three hours a week. An insurance company, they just said that they did job related reading and writing. But it's interesting to me that they said a small insurance company. And what we've been hearing from talking to our colleagues around the province is there aren't always local employers that have hundreds of employees, right? Some of them are going to be very small, maybe less than five people, maybe owner operated, um, could only have one or two staff, which doesn't mean that they don't need workplace literacy instruction or support, okay? Um, hospital, computer-based writing, digital literacy, everybody's talking about it. 20 hours with up to 10 hours out of class practice. 
So this is an interesting example to me because it kind of addresses the question of, does everything have to be offered on site at the employer um, sort of and counting all those hours? So in this case, there were 10 hours of out of class practice. So I would say that that's not necessarily um, common for people to assign homework uh, with workplace literacy. And the reason for that is because, you know, if you're working with individuals who are doing shift work, they might already work in a 12 hour shift, right? And then they participate in the class and then to assign homework on top of that may just be a little overwhelming. Okay, a few more, there is a large gasket maker. Please don't ask me what a gasket is, I don't know. <laughs> But I think it's like a manufacturing type thing, right? So they did a basic reading and writing um, courses for a total of, sorry, I want to, uh-oh, hang on, for a total of 50 hours. And then we had another manufacturer who did reading for 30 hours. So, you know, it, foundational skills definitely have a role, right, in the workplace. So this is not all technical training. This is foundational stuff. We had a small painting company that offered uh, soft skills as a certificate program for about 12 hours and a manufacturer of piping. So what they did is they focused on math and document use. Okay, so I like to prime the pump by talking about types of workplace literacy programs because you do begin to see that there's a real variety of topics that can be addressed. And programs differ considerably in terms of number and hours, sometimes referred to as the dose. Sounds like a very medical, somebody has a bottle of pills or something, but you know, it's, it's funny, but the number of hours of intervention is often referred to in evaluation as the dosage. Okay, so I like to have these kinds of examples in my back pocket because I imagine, you know, if I was trying to talk to my employment and training consultant and they were giving me some pushback, you know, maybe saying, hey, your program has to run for 26 weeks or it has to run for X amount of time. I don't think so. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, I recognize that what I think about things may not be the end all be all. But the reality is, I think we need to take our cues from employers it will make it a little more difficult when the programs are shorter. It limits the kinds of things that you can evaluate. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Before we get there though, does anybody have any other examples of workplace literacy programs that you have run or that you are running or that you're planning to run that you'd like to share? I really don't wanna be a talking head for this entire time, so. And I know if push comes to shove, I'll call upon my, st oh, Alicia. Thank you, Alicia. Go for it. Um, I joined late, so sorry if, I hope this wasn't shared. Well, anyway, uh, we had done or are in the process actually of doing um, a local organization has asked us to train their staff of 200 plus individuals on how to use Teams for work. Um, so they had been using, I think, a different platform and decided they want to use Teams and a lot of stuff didn't know how. So we're coming on site to them with equipment and we're teaching in multiple sessions to get everybody at different time slots and it's going really well so far. Awesome. Thanks, Alicia. That's, that's a great example. Any other examples that people want to share? So in that case, it was as little as three hours. So again, you know, that's what the employer wants. That's what they need. So in my opinion, that's what we step up to address. I'd like to hear one more example. All right, Jeremy or Anne Marie, can you step up here? Uh, I'll go. Uh, <laughs> I'm quicker on the button than Jeremy, maybe. <laughs> um, I think we're we're seeing a lot of soft skills related requests. So uh, communication in the workplace which, you know, engaging with others is a big concern of uh, employers at both the employer level and management level. And uh, I'll give you one more, even though you asked for just, for just one, uh, <laughs> some professional rating. That's been sort of a common thing as well, um, especially when recording um, reports and communicating with, let's say, uh, parents. So we have a, a child care um, um, employer who is concerned about the communication between staff and parents and making sure it's professional. So what does professional look like? Um, so those are two things that we've been focusing on. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And Audrey, I see your hand up. 
Hi there. So I work at the Labour Education Centre in Toronto, and um, because we're rooted in the labour uh, movement, um, we work with unions, and so we get requests, interestingly, more from unions to help them to build some foundational skills with um, their union members who are employees with um, you know various organisations, companies, City of Toronto, etc. Um, so it's my question really is, you know, kind of what's the parameter, like what's the borders of what is workplace literacy, particularly where it's um, unions that approach certainly labor education center uh, more than employers. Well, first, I, I love the examples, Audrey, because uh, we have been working with one of our unions here locally, and um, we were working with their pre-apprentices, but as our relationship with them is maturing, they have identified that they have individuals within their union who are not apprentices, so they might be working in security or custodial or light manufacturing, but they're concerned that um, these individuals you know, they need some support with foundational reading and comprehension because they can't understand um, completely the foundational documents that are there to support them, like the collective agreements and all those kinds of things. So if to go back to your question of, I think what you're asking is where does work with unions and workplace literacy intersect? Is that a, a safe way to paraphrase? Okay, so this might sound like it's completely off the top of my head, but in, in my mind, I don't think there's a huge difference. I see the unions as, as really significant partners in promoting workplace literacy in a positive light. And should it become necessary, ensuring that workplace literacy is not abused, is not used as a way to, um, I don't know, remove certain staff people, um, that, that it needs to be very respectfully put forward as something that is being done with and for employees and not something that's being done to them. Does that help at all? Because I, I don't know that there's official words yeah. around this, but you know, I'm happy, let's discuss. So I have another um, related question and boy, it just left my brain. Um, the other sort of trying to find the border of uh, sort of the level of literacy, like what is foundational skills compared to skills that are not foundational. One of my concerns is this kind of slow creep towards um, uh, folks who have, you know, basic, like folks who have a literacy, they're fine, but they're in their workplace, they have to learn new digital uh, skills and different kinds of technologies. So I guess I worry a bit of um, sort of a, you know, the most marginalized will continue to be most marginalized because their relationship to the labor market is precarious. And in those kinds of jobs, the employer, there's not a lot of uh, interest in uh, supporting their employees to build their, their foundational literacy skills. So I just worry that we're sort of creeping up to support workers, and I'm not saying this is wrong, who have the foundational skills, but they need the workplace skills. And to me, it's, uh, you know, um, you know, if, like, if employers can get training for free, they'll take it if it doesn't interrupt their productivity and their bottom line. But it basically excuses them from actually making that kind of commitment longer term to support their employees you know, from pay and everything. I, I guess I want to make sure that we attend to, you know, the structured inequality, right, in our, our economic systems that we live in, right, which are capitalist based, exploitive based. So how do we address, or how do we consider the larger context as we do workplace literacy, which is to me, basically a constructed uh, system that I don't know who it's benefiting, but it's a chip away kind of issue that doesn't deal with the larger systemic inequalities and also the larger issue of we're actually not really serving those who are most marginalized, uh, who may or may not be in the workplace. 
sorry to bring up the big issue right now, but I no, I, I very I much appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I feel like my brain is splitting off into a bunch of different um, places here. So I'm going to do my best, Audrey, to kind of summarize my response to what I think of are the two or three or four main points here. So in terms of whether I think that workplace literacy is detracting from people who are more marginalized, I appreciate where that question is coming from, but I still maintain that our existing literacy system is still out there, right? And it's not to say that we shouldn't be working in workplaces where people are most marginalized. To me, that's where we most want to be, right? But given that workplace literacy is really quite new for a good chunk of Ontario, right? I mean, working where you work, it's kind of what you eat, sleep and breathe, right? But for the rest of us, having been largely ignored for decades by employers. I mean, I think we need to get our foot in the door. We need to start documenting some good practices. We need to start furthering the agendas that we have as we gain knowledge. So that's gonna be our approach here. Yeah, for sure, we are excited to get five employers because we wanted to learn what we didn't know. And as we're learning what we didn't know, we can start thinking about how to more strategically reach out to those companies and employers that we believe really have some significant needs, right? Uh, in terms of the what constitutes foundational skills and what constitutes technical skills, I feel like that's a moving landscape. Right. And what I mean by that is like obviously 15, 20 years ago, people who were good at technology, um, they had like kind of the special status, right? Because not everybody had it, not everybody needed it. So they had this special skill set. But now I would argue that digital capability has become integral to every aspect of our lives, which means that some of those things that probably 10 years ago, like teaching Word, teaching Excel, teaching Microsoft Teams, might not have been considered part of a foundational skill portfolio. But I would argue that they are becoming that way now because the bar is rising, because uh, you know digital literacy has filtered into our lives in so many ways. So not to sort of try to take an out, but I mean, we've had many discussions in our office about how the definition of foundational skills has been changing and how it's been increasing because as the knowledge-based economy, right, um, continues to grow and as we differentiate our, ourselves from AI and those kinds of things, the kinds of skills that people need and can demonstrate are changing. So I don't know if I'm helping. Uh, you know what I'd love to do, Audrey? I'd love to find you and have a conversation one on one because I love some of the points that you're making. And I think we do need to keep them top of mind in terms of, you know, remembering where we come from, remembering what it is that we try to do and why we try to do it and not getting lost in other people's agendas. Okay. And so I'll, this is my last um, point. Um, okay. You know, I've done most of my uh, adult literacy work out west, and uh, certainly in Alberta and BC and other provinces, workplace literacy has been part of the adult literacy system, like from the get go, you know, 50 odd years ago. So I kind of found it interesting that it, it was a brand new thing to the LBS system here in Ontario. And I do think that um, the, one of the big questions is, you know, what is the relationship between LBS and ES? I know it's going through some big transformation because, um, you know, that sort of silo sectioning off between both of those programs was kind of like weird in the first place. But then how do we not end up, not duplicating, but how do employment services system and LBS system work together with this new, but I say not really new, uh, <laughs> notion of workplace literacy. Audrey, I would love to see you in a policy position within the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and <laughs> Skills Development. And just yesterday, uh, I was running a community of practice um, for workplace literacy. And, you know, again, I'd love it if you could participate in that because I was hearing some really I think strategic ideas from some of our colleagues about how they are leveraging the employment services system 
recognizing the ties that ES has with employers, um, the desire to support people while they are working, right? So job developers who are, um, you know, having people placed and wanting to see them be successful. And how do we bring what we know about skills development to further support those folks? So yeah, I think you're you're right on top of it. So thank you very much for your, your comments. I see we have a few other folks. So we have Amory, then Lisa, and then Tracy. So please go ahead, Amory. Hi, um, Audrey, some great points there, but there is a lot to unpack. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to get back to the union conversation. Uh, we do have uh, one, I don't think Jeremy's ours, but the, we do have one partner on our project that is dealing with the union. And so far that has not been an issue. However, the partner did try to engage an employer whose place was going undergoing unionization and that did become an issue and that employer had to withdraw from the project because of that because of that so i think getting back to the union what our experience is and what i sort of foresee is that it's just an extra level of check in during the process that you know um, often the employer or the person that you're talking to the hr department has to check with management and you know all those kinds of things so it would just be another level of check in often um, you know, and um, also, yeah, it's an opportunity to get the whole group behind the training too, if the union is on board. And um, as far as the difference between LBS and, and, and mission drift maybe is sort of what um, I thought I heard was a concern in your, in your question. It was something that I was thinking about really early on in our project as well, because I thought, what's the difference between LBS training and corporate training? Um, you know, and uh, what are we offering that's not out there? And I think that's where I start with LBS is what are we offering that's not out there that can help people build their skills. And um, that's often that, that contextualized help at those foundational levels um, of many areas, reading, writing, math, computers, all those kinds of the baseline on which you build the skills for other skills to grow. And uh, once it starts getting into specific areas and more advanced areas, then I tell employers that that's not what we do. And during the organizational needs assessment, we tell them up front, here's what we're offering and this is how we're different than what else is out there, just so that they have the context for the conversation we're about to have. As far as meeting the needs of people who we, we fear may be lost in the workplace, um, I feel like this is an opportunity to find them we are having conversations with employers that they might not have thought about otherwise. We're talking about basic skills. We're talking about people who may be struggling that they don't see within their workplace. And we're talking about how to help them. So I really do think as far as disadvantaged populations, if that's the word I need, but I'm not sure it is, but you know, I think that this is an opportunity to find them and to help them, you know, like we do in so many other areas at LBS. Um, and also during our, our workplace literacy program, we provide extra services to make sure that we're pr providing opportunities for those people to be found. We do have a one-on-one -on -one session that we're providing in workplaces, should the employer, employer choose for us to do that, where we're opening up an opportunity for people to meet privately with LBS instructors and discuss their learning challenges under the premise of professional development goal setting. So um, we, we are coming at it many different ways to make sure that we are finding and addressing those people within a workplace who may be hidden. And I think it's really coming from a good place and it's LBS doing what it's always done, just you know, in a different scenario. I say the same church, different pew. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, you know, I definitely think that we still have a lot to learn when it comes to how to market, how to push, when to push, those kinds of things. But yeah, I, I, I mean, because Anne-Marie and I work in the same office, I do think that through the workplace literacy programming that we've done so far, we have had a, a chance to meet people where they're at, to point them to uh, programming that would be useful, and above all, to protect their their desire for confidentiality. They're not comfortable with their employer knowing perhaps just how low their skills are, um, but now they know that there are free programs locally that can help them and we're able to point them in those directions. Not quite the same as having a program on site where everybody is able to sort of um, feel comfortable taking programming where they're at, but I, again, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, Lisa. Morning, folks. Um, this conversation is 
absolutely gold. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think if you talk to any literacy practitioner, we all went into literacy for really altruistic reasons. We didn't get into literacy to, um, you know, to get someone a job. That's not sort of where the, the initial impetus was um, to start working with folks. And I, you know, despite the fact that a very big focus for our programs at the literacy group of late are really heavily focused on employment, because we're managed by Employment Ontario, there is an element, Audrey, where we, we look at these programs that I don't even want to say that we have to hold our nose and deliver them, because that's not really what I'm talking about, but they are in demand in the community. And while these are the ones that are held up by the ministry as our go-to programs, they fund and pave the way for us to continue with programming that the ministry is less interested in us delivering writ large. And so we, we play those things off each other to make sure that the folks who need programming that is less, I don't wanna put a capital V valued by the ministry, um, but, but there's a, there is a sentiment that when they say you can really only have 10% people on an independence pathway, that's what we're gonna support. But we have other organizations in the community that contribute to our funding that we then go out and provide that that programming for so i think there is a way to do both of these things i think there's a place for a heavy workplace component in what we do with our literacy because at the core of even those independence pathways for some of our learners employment or volunteerism is part of that and those workplace training pieces come into play there as well um, but I also think that every jurisdiction in, will be different in how employment services and LBS rub shoulders with each other. We have a great relationship with our employment services folks in Waterloo Region, in part because we've spent a long time building that. And so as they are scaling back on the training that they're delivering, their training is short-term training at a much higher level than a community-based organization offers. It is more corporate in style, and I've seen the corporate versions of what we are providing at the literacy group. It's not custom designed for the learner. It doesn't take into consideration their barriers. It doesn't do all of those things that Emery was talking about. So I think that w there is a niche, and, and if we are really getting an opportunity to see what corporate training looks like, see what employment services training looks like and position ourselves in that Venn diagram gap of where LBS and ES function together. Um, every jurisdiction will be different because there are gonna be some really, really strong employment services training programs that do actually cater to low level learners who don't function well or, or benefit well from a corporate style model. Um, there's but it's the work to figure out what that niche is and where our strengths are as community-based organizations or you know other level of LBS organizations to really fit the needs of the community. And that's what we do, right? That's that's our our expertise is is the not so much organizational needs assessment, but a community needs assessment, what's required in our community at any given time. The other cool thing about what we do in LBS is we're a lot more nimble than a lot of other organizations. So addressing that need month to month instead of decade to decade is what we do really well, particularly at the community-based level. We, you know, I hate the word pivot because we we're all sick to death of it now, but pivot has been something that LBS has been doing for as long as LBS has been around because we're learner-based and an extension of learner-based also then means community-based and it also means employer-based if that's the direction that you wanna go. Um, so I, the, the concern is a valid one. There are ways to manage that concern and still stay true to the heart of what we do in LBS um, and, and make sure that we're able to provide that kind of programming. I will say as a program manager who works in, in a very blended program that there's also a caveat there as well because we are an LBS program. We're not a disability services program. There are those programs in our community that do that job better as well. 
And where we start seeing that drift on the other side of the equation, we partner up with organizations in the same way that we address drift in the other direction as well. So finding that middle ground where we provide literacy supports for a lot of folks, that's really, I think, the key. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I really appreciate the insights that that people are are sharing. I mean, for me, we have quite a focus, not just on workplace, but also presumably on underrepresented groups right now, right? So, and one of the things that I think about is, to what extent is the ministry really interested in addressing the needs of underrepresented groups and lower level learners, right? I mean, I think they'd love it if it all looked like everybody was at a high level two, ready to move into level three with two weeks of intervention, right? That looks good on, on their stats. That's not the reality that we see sort of out in the field. So, you know, I, I'm a big believer in trying to influence policy as well as doing all the backdoor stuff we have to do at the local level to do what we really think is important. Uh, Tracy, I see your hand up, and then I'm going to move us back into the evaluation yeah. territory. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, and I'm hesitating on making my comments, but so I'm listening <laughs> with Audrey and Lisa have made very valid points, but I'm thinking about, I guess, flipping it a different direction is looking at from an LBS lens, there's all these different funding opportunities out there for workforce literacy as a whole. But when we look back at the LBS system, and I speak just from LBS, I'm, I'm concerned about our SQS values and OALCF and how all of that wraps into this properly. And so I'm reflecting on the other two speakers' comments, but um, what portion of our LBS funds is allowing us to be flexible and kind of live outside the box of this workforce literacy? And I think the challenge we've had as an LBS agency with a small budget is figuring out how to dabble in that world, but meet our outcomes that the ministries required us to do. So. I'm spinning evaluation in a little different way and evaluating how this model works, how this measurement um, process works. And if there's a if there's a different way to measure uh, some of the successes, because the challenge we've had in workplace literacy is I need this guy to learn this. And then we've got to put them into these ministry milestones. And they're like, we don't want to go there. We just want this. So the paperwork and evaluation has become uh, burdensome to some employers and they've they've on the flip side said that that's not what we're looking for but i do have this and when you say marginalized underrepresented group type category of person that needs our assistance but we got to keep putting a square peg in a round hole anyway i'll just leave it there and let you keep rolling but i'm just wondering resistance to this lbs model and the measurement system that's there is it necessarily fitting into workplace literacy how we could do it or could we do it different and if we could how do we influence change in the ministry to allow a little bit of that dabbling in that other area without those, I know I see Audrey nodding her head, but um, the current SQS values are very weighted um, in a different way. Thanks, so. Tracy. I mean, I know you have a ton of experience, not just in LBS, but certainly in sort of like broader um, systems and whatnot. So I think that uh, workplace literacy should have its own performance management system. It's different enough from what we're doing with people who come into classrooms and one-on-one, -on -one, you know, learning situations. I mean, I don't even like the current system, so never mind how it fits for, you know, uh, employers. And of course, it's heinous, you know, like I was talking to one of our providers who happens to do adult credit, ESL, and literacy and basic skills. And she said to bring somebody into adult credit requires one page of paperwork, ESL takes two pages, and literacy and basic skills take 16. So, so what's up with that, right? So yeah, we definitely need to do some more, I'll use it on, no, I'll call it um, informed advice, since this is a recorded webinar. Um, we need to provide more of that to the government because they're actually shooting themselves in their own foot, right? By not making some of these changes because they're making it very difficult for us to bring employers to the table, for us to really figure out what counts when we're talking about workplace literacy. And there's my little segue back into evaluation, so. Okay, thank you guys so much for that. Um, you know, I feel like my brain got stretched a little bit there and I'm always reminded by the passion and the intelligence that my, my fellow um, colleagues bring to the table. I have been keeping an eye on the chat and I appreciate people's comments in there. I'm assuming that everybody can see the chat. If, is there anybody who can't see the chat? If, if you can't, could you let me know? 
because I'm going to let you read that on your own if if everybody can see it and comment accordingly. OK, I'm not saying that anybody can't. OK, um, so yeah, please keep your comments coming. OK, so we've sort of talked about this. Why evaluate workplace literacy delivery? But I want to see if anybody has any other comments. You know, what is the purpose of evaluating workplace literacy delivery? You know, we spent it, sometimes it just seems like it's an, all we can do to get programs up and running. What are we talking about this additional layer of evaluation? Why on earth would we do it? Anybody have any comments on that? Or did you use up all your oxygen on the last question? Maybe that's what happened. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to keep going, but certainly that door is not shut. So I would say, you know, we evaluate workplace literacy for the same reasons that we would evaluate any other activities or programming that we participate in so that we can learn from our experiences. Rarely, if ever, does anyone get everything right on the first try. Well, or if you do, then you're you're in the minority there. So goal number one for evaluation is to learn things that perhaps you didn't know before. And from time to time, and actually with increasing frequency, we're asked to prove that what we're doing is effective. And as much as I would love it, if I could just respond that I am confident that programs Literacy Link South Central runs are effective, we are usually, if not always, asked to demonstrate that a program is effective. Okay, so one of the best ways to do that is to document the results of evaluation so that you have hard evidence of the ways in which a program is serving its intended purposes. And that's kind of a loaded question. The ways in, or a comment rather, the ways in which a program is serving its intended purposes. So sometimes the answers to these questions require some pretty deep thinking, right? And, and it might seem like a luxury we don't always have. LBS is a busy program, no matter where it's being delivered. So it can be difficult to create the time and space for the reflection that we need. But evaluation gives us a chance to pause and think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And to the last point here, um, whether or not there's anything that we might do differently to achieve better results. So let's take a second and think about the different audiences that exist for workplace literacy programming. This is where you might consider um, the different types of organizations that have a vested interest and might care about evaluation results. So one would hope that delivery agencies have a very vested interest in how programs are received and how effective they are. And different levels of government often have an interest in workplace literacy programming. And while I'm not gonna get political here, the reality is that government often, although not always, funds workplace literacy programming. And with the expenditure of public funds comes an expectation that such funds are used appropriately. So how would we demonstrate that this is the case? A well-crafted evaluation can help us provide this kind of evidence. What's crummy is when you know, the ministry introduces its own evaluation measures and then we have to do something additional and on top of that to actually demonstrate what we think is of value. Employers are also interested in the results of workplace literacy programs and their reasons for being interested can be quite varied. Many workplaces have to invest some of their own money, whether it's for communication to employees, to have management and other levels of staff talk to LBS providers, participating in an organizational needs assessment, or releasing staff from their positions so that they can take the training. For all these reasons, workplace literacy programming is an investment for employers, whether they're actually paying for the training or not, right? So there's still a lot of back of the house work that should be happening at an employer that the employer has to free up time for. Um, an, employee's, an employer's bottom line can be a compelling factor for participating in workplace literacy programming, but it's not the only reason. And we'll talk about other motivators later in the session. And last, but by no means least, there are the employees themselves. As you all know from delivering adult literacy programming, adult learners can have a lot of competing priorities, so it can be hard to find the time for learning in general, let alone after a 12-hour continental shift. But many employees do have a stake in the programming, especially since studies show that employees who are management get a lot more opportunities for PD than um, staff who are not management. Employees can also have personal reasons for investing in workplace literacy programming, not just for advancement at work. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. 
Any other groups that you guys think I missed? Any other groups that have a stake here that um, I haven't identified? It's Audrey here. Uh, the um, frontline workers, not the managers, but you know, identifying what what is their um, desire. What would what would they get out of workplace training, and how much control would they have over the say of the type of training? when it happens, what's required, and what are the measures, right? Speaking of evaluation, that they have a sense that they have a say in those evaluative measures, right? I don't want to be judged by uh, a system that actually disregards half of my uh, capabilities, and these sometimes are called soft skills. Uh, so I just, I want to point out Linda's uh, note in chat about mental health. And I'm sorry if I'm talking too much in this, uh, in this session here. Um, I feel like there's a, a massive sort of uh, void in regards to addressing to me what's always apparent um, is that, uh, you know, historically we've called it holistic uh, a learning approach. Uh, now the new terminology uses trauma-informed approach. You know, there's anti-oppression approach, definitely that's the history of adult, adult literacy um, compared to uh, uh, labor force skills assessment, which is deficit-based. So I feel like this is an opportunity to kind of perhaps identify a particular niche in regards to uh, addressing the vacancy of um, attending to mental health. I'll just give an example. So I worked on a project um, with MTML in regard that was looking at the use of smartphones for seeking work, for looking for work and employment skills. And it became, and we use a trauma informed lens to design the, the project. And that made it really, really clear that uh, it's minimum 50% around people's sense of self and their identity, whether it's a worker or I'm unemployed or you know my embedded history of schooling and whatever my life has been for me to have a sense of myself as capable and highly structured hierarchical systems that disregard the whole person. So I wonder if there would be interest in the LBS uh, practitioner field to push for um, taking you know, those new skills for success. And I absolutely despise that framework. I've done tons of research on that whole IELTS levels and all of that to take um, those new skills for success and to kind of reframe them or highlight that mental health is a missing component in the workforce development field overall. It's only when people are, are within workplaces and it's sort of trendy and it's very easy to spin doctor mental health in the workplace, but it's still based on a hierarchical system. So those who don't, who, those who can't demonstrate their skills and knowledge, we just say skills, we never say knowledge, which is ridiculous, you know, <laughs> right? it's what people know, um, to demonstrate that uh, there is a need to have a mental health lens and framework in the LBS system and the perfect place is perhaps workplace literacy so that you address the shaming and the systemic oppression in a way that helps people with what I like to say their embodied knowledge based on their life history that is valuable and uh, like as Lisa was saying what is valued well let's name what's valued so Sorry, it might be a bit of an outfield idea, but uh, when it comes to evaluation, you can't do evaluation without starting in the beginning of your intentions, your objectives. And if we only use the government's objective, we're basically 
perpetuating the deficit model and you know who loses all the time, right? So I feel like perhaps this is where we could push back and say that we, you know, workplace literacy and uh, empl and worker well-being and mental health goes hand in hand. And that we take that highly technicalized and dehumanized skills for success system and we reframe it as in workers' bodies, their knowledge and their ability to, uh, to demonstrate it. I think what's happening is workers, especially frontline, especially precarious, they have to leave their knowledge and skills at the door when they go into work. And so they don't, they're not even allowed to be able to express their fabulous capacity. So I, to me, I'm interested in workplace literacy around that, that it's always whole person approach. And I'm really, really concerned that workplace literacy from uh, the government's perspective is more of the dehumanizing approach. So I just wanted to bring Linda's point around mental health as like a core issue in regards to workplace literacy, along with everything else in LBS. But if we, if we don't see that, we're just, we're just continuing um, a deficit-based model that needs people to not have skills. You see, we have a model that requires people to be less than they really are. Do you know what I'm saying? So we need to change our view of this. Okay, I'm done, you know, sorry to go on. <laughs> no, no, that's, uh, I, I think, you know, from seeing the, the chat here, um, yeah, I think that there is definitely growing recognition that mental health, you know, is, it's no longer like that secondary issue that might need to also be tackled as part of, you know, wraparound services and that kind of stuff. It's really becoming integral. So one of the things that I'm thinking, um, Audrey, is, you know, the provincial support organizations for literacy have been asked to develop resources and tools. And I'm gonna flip this part of the conversation to some of them to say, look, you know, we have an opportunity here in Ontario to start building our own pool of knowledge um, around workplace literacy. And I think that's where we can exert some say, right? Because they've not been told what to develop, they've just been told to go forth and develop. So, you know, if we say this is a priority and we ask some of them to include that in the development of their resources, then we're making that statement and we're providing our practitioners, I think, with some really good materials because, you know, they often know some practitioners are very nervous right obviously about moving into mental health territory because they worry that they might do more harm than good right they're not a mental health professional what do i do so i think we could really help our practitioners by providing them with training and resources that you know can help them look at these things they are holistic i think by and large in their approach but it's probably more by intuition than by design so helping them more from the design side i think would be really cool Okay, so thank you very much. I mean, obviously, remembering the learner as as the focal point is so critical. So what is important to think about from an evaluation perspective is that not all parties are looking for the same results. I think we've been talking about that sort of throughout the webinar, right? What's driving each of the ships, so to speak, right? So let's have a look at some of these audiences. So if you look at just gonna move my thing on my screen here. Nope, didn't mean to do that. Sorry, I'm trying to move my chat somewhere. Okay, over there. So if we look at delivery agencies and government as two separate audiences. So delivery agencies are, I think, looking for improved literacy practices at work and elsewhere, because it's not always about the workplace, change learner beliefs about literacy themselves and education. So those are some areas that I think most delivery agencies are thinking about. Government, on the other hand, um, probably looking at uh, number of learners served, satisfaction rate. We've all seen the customer service satisfaction stuff that uh, the ministry insists upon. The likelihood of making referrals and why they insist on formalized referrals, I don't know. Word of mouth doesn't seem to have a lot of meaning. Uh, scalability, 
and replicability are things that tend to interest government. And if you've written a fair number of proposals, you've probably seen the whole scalability and replicability. Not only do they want you to figure out how to do it in your own community, but how you can do it anywhere um, else in either the province or in um, Canada. So, And then we have employers and employees. So what I'm hoping that you guys will take away from these two slides is that, you know, there are different perspectives, different stakes, different kind of skin in the game, if you will, and therefore different expectations when it comes to evaluation. So employers, as we mentioned earlier, are interested in retaining workers, uh, preparing employees for future training. So, you know, building the skills so that, you know, additional skills can stick reducing errors or waste, meeting uh, health and safety requirements, improving customer relations, some you know, teamwork and other soft skills, financial literacy. Some want to become an employer of choice and that speaks back to competition and empowerment. So before we leave the employer one here, like I'll highlight reduce errors or waste. So in previous uh, sessions, we've talked about don't over promise what you can do with a single workplace literacy program. Okay, so if I had an employer say, yep, I want you to come in and do eight hours worth of training and I expect a 50% reduction in errors on the job. I don't think that's a realistic outcome and it's not something that I would be looking to build into an evaluation plan. Okay, if you had a five year longitudinal workplace literacy uh, program, yeah, maybe that's something that you could look at. Okay, if we think about employees, um, increased skills, sure, um, but also self esteem, you know, and I don't think there's a literacy practitioner out there that wouldn't probably put increased self esteem first as an outcome of training. But also there's aspirations for more education, relationships with family and fellow workers, soft skills learning more about the company, um, feeling better about the company that they work for, and an improved attitude towards self and learning. Okay, so this is not the end all be all, but these are some of the things that I think um, differ from audience to audience when it comes to evaluation. So we spent quite a bit of time today looking at the different audiences for workplace literacy evaluation and the results that each might want to see as a result of participating in or funding or delivering this type of programming. But why? Where are we headed with this discussion? So some of you may know the term theory of change from past webinars and discussions on evaluation. But if you don't, um, it's, I'm sure you've probably executed theories of change, you just haven't called it that. But basically a theory of change is a description and an illustration of how and why a desired change is expected to happen in a particular context. So basically what changes do you expect to see as a result of the workplace literacy program and for whom? So once you've identified the types of changes you wanna see, you know, whether it's a change in self-esteem, whether it's a, an increase in skills, an increase, in, an increase in an employee's perception of whether they can do a particular task. I mean, once you've identified those things and you've thought about who those changes will affect, you'll be ready to start crafting the actual questions. You'll also need to think about how you'll ask the questions. Will they be open-ended, multiple choice? Will they involve rating scales? Will you use paper-based surveys, online surveys? interviews, focus groups. I mean, these things have implications for resources. So, you know, interviews are amazing because you get such a depth of information, uh, but then you may have some challenges in collating the results, right? Because they can be very, very diverse. Who will you ask in the evaluation? And will you need more than one evaluation tool? More than likely you will. Depending on the changes that you wanna see, does the company already have any baseline data? And we can talk about some of these areas a little bit later. So again, some of you may have participated in the second webinar that we delivered as part of this series on assessment or organizational needs assessments. Um, what we've realized is it's not enough to just talk vaguely about workplace literacy and what we want to get out of it. So, you know, we really have to be more deliberate 
And during the training session on ONAs, we discussed how sometimes when you're talking to employers, they're not entirely certain what it is they want to see happen. They just know that they have a general problem, right? So it's our job as literacy professionals to take what the issues are that we're hearing, and maybe not just from employers. Again, in a perfect world, you're talking to supervisors. It would be amazing to talk to the employees themselves, but sometimes that's got to be a work in progress, right? Because a, an employer who's uncertain about whether workplace literacy is even worth participating in may not open the door um, at first blush to having you talk to people who are working on the floor. But once you get in there, and you start developing and delivering uh, programming and the employer is brought alongside or maybe further along the continuum of understanding what exactly training can contribute to besides an increase in the potential bottom line, then maybe you can make the argument to talk one-on-one -on -one with folks, right? With those frontline employees. And we really wanna get down to the specific outcomes, right? So once you determine the types of programming you wanna deliver and what specifically people will learn or experience as a result of participating in those programs, then you can think about how to develop those tools. So what do we want people to learn how to do better? Uh, do we want them to use workplace documents better? Which ones? Do we want them to do math better? What kinds? Do we want them to read better? How much better and for what purposes? Okay, so we've talked about the role of authentic materials in LBS, and I think we all know why we use them. Does anybody want to comment on this? What is the use of authentic materials? Why is it considered a good idea in LBS? Anybody want to weigh in on that? Why not just use the, the old, you know, sort of readers and stuff like that? Why would authentic materials matter? Anyone? Anne-Marie? Oh, I gotta move you guys over. Hi there. Um, you know, I, I get back to uh, when I was in school and you think, when am I ever gonna use this? Way back when. And I think that by contextualizing exercises within materials that people are using and will be using, uh, further helps with engagement and motivation. Yeah, I, I think definitely it can deepen the learning um, for participants. So if we look at a couple of things, um, the role of authentic materials and workplace literacy has implications for applicability. So again, I was reading some evaluation studies around workplace literacy. And the one that I was reading said, the learners who use workplace examples in class at least 20 to 30% of the time had a gain on reading scenarios that was nearly twice that of other learners. Okay, so using those real authentic materials makes a difference. Also in terms of transfer, transferability of learning. So learners who use workplace examples 20 to 30% of the time had a gain in the area of planning, but all the other learners did not, right? So planning for their future when it came to the next step in terms of their educational journey. Okay, so you know, sometimes when people think about evaluation, they think, oh, I have to use standardized um, instruments versus non-standardized instruments. So just want to take a second to talk about some of the pros and cons. I mean, the reality for LBS, um, standardized tests, you know, they're, they're best used um, for a short duration. They measure only general literacy ability because they're much more generic and they're very expensive to create, right? So usually, we don't use standardized tests in LBS, okay? By contrast, custom designed assessments or tests are more practical. Um, they include employee rating scales, and you can also get them filled out by supervisors, and that kind of provides a point of contrast, and they can include job-related reading scenarios. The issue with custom assessments is that they limit um, large-scale comparisons. So say that, you know, your program is, you know, let's go into the future three years and say you deliver at five different workplaces regularly. You know, so you may be interested in your workplace literacy results from company to company and across companies, right? So in that kind of a case, you'd have to use something more standardized if you wanted to compare across sites. And maybe you don't want to, right? There's absolutely nothing telling us right now that we need to do this. Um, and the other piece of it is, 
using custom designed assessments, um, they're really great for making sure that you're speaking specifically to a particular workplace, but you can't compare from one site to another, right? So again, maybe you don't want to, we're certainly not being asked to at this point, but you know how ministries and government are often interested in rolling up data across the province, right? Well, they have difficulty doing that if every single program that is involved in workplace literacy is counting different things. But that at this point in time is not our problem. It's their problem. Okay, so let's get more specific now in terms of the area of evaluation. Okay, so these are just some of the methods that you can use to gather data. Um, we live in the age of the survey, which is understandable. I mean, they're relatively inexpensive to produce. It does some of the, the work of, well, a lot of the work of collating the data. But um, these are some of the things that you can consider, right? And my overall caveat here is don't ever ask questions that you don't actually need the answer to. I mean, it's just not respectful to do that to people. Um, and it creates work and confusion. So you may want to do pre and post assessments. Um, I think it depends on the situation. And I know that's a really irritating answer, right? It depends because that's not exactly, you know, doesn't provide somebody with, with a, a blueprint. But some of the challenges that I've seen with pre and post assessments is they have to be incredibly carefully designed, right? Because you might ask somebody to evaluate their performance on something before they have an intervention or a dose of training or whatever you want to call it. And then afterwards, they didn't know what they didn't know. So I've seen a lot of post assessments kind of get messed up because as people become more aware of what they didn't know, they actually rate themselves lower, right, in the post. That can be a problem. Self-assessment, I think, is quite a useful tool, but then you're looking at people's perceptions, right? And so we, we know that sometimes people's perceptions of their abilities can differ from their reality, right? So, but self-assessment can be a really good tool. I find it often engages uh, people because they're thinking about themselves and you know lots of people don't get a chance to do that very often and they like it when it happens. Classroom observation can be a pretty powerful way of gathering data but again it's a resource issue right so you don't just have a teacher going in teaching getting out you know if you wanted to include classroom observation you'd have to provide the time for someone to do that. Observations from other employees and supervisors um, I think this can be very valuable because supervisors might be noticing certain things um, with other staff or vice versa. You know, people on the floor might be noticing things about supervisors and, you know, you want to see a change, right, in, in certain things that you might be trying to evaluate. So you want to get those perceptions. Obviously, learner activities, interviews, and, you know, the data review. So again, this last area I don't think it's an area that we're likely to often deal in because it assumes intensive, in my opinion, intensive and ongoing uh, evaluation. You know, at this point, we know that we'll be doing workplace literacy for 15 months, and that kind of seems like a long time, right? In, in, the, in the scheme of things, it isn't, but in our world, it is. So trying to draw conclusions from sort of year over year training is not often in our um, wheelhouse, in my opinion, okay? All right, sorry, just keeping an eye on the chat. Jeremy and Amory, if anything comes up in the chat that you feel like I need to address, can you please let me know? Okay. Okay, so let's take a second and talk about the length and size of programming. Now, I think this is a bit of a hot topic, um, has been a hot topic in adult literacy programming over the years, right? So how much learning, how, how much time do you have to spend uh, in delivering a program before you can reasonably expect somebody to get something out of it? It's a pretty big question. And I bet you some of you have been challenged from time to time, maybe by um, your employment and training consultants. You know, maybe you thought you'd deliver something that was nine hours and they said, no, nope, no, nope, not long enough, gotta be longer. Has anybody ever had that experience and feel comfortable sharing it? Lisa? That was definitely a hot topic where we were. It, 
changed how we did intake. We we were doing this sort of traditional LBS intake where we would wait and make sure that everybody was in class before we put them into CAMS. And with our short programs, you do not have the luxury of time to be able to do that. So consider putting someone's service plan in and pending it, and then putting in an actual start date um, on the very first day of class so that you're not having potentially lots of paperwork to do and to, um, to con some of your staff from different areas of your program to get the paperwork done. So that's the one piece. We, we got some pushback. Uh, the big question wasn't so much that this program is too short, but we really needed to validate that literacy learning was happening in that short duration of time. And that's part of the reason why we actually had to add pre and post assessments um, so that we could make that direct comparison that skills were being built in 10 hours of training, in 16 hours of training, because there was quite a bit of eyebrow raising, um, particularly with our customer service program, right? Is this a webinar? You can't put a webinar into CAMS and call that training. That's not what that's not what this is designed to be. So we we had to jump through some hoops to really demonstrate that learning was happening. And to do that, we had to use different tools than a milestone because a milestone would not really demonstrate that learning was happening, even though that was the tool that we were given by the ministry to show that. So you do have to be careful with really short programs for some um, organizational reasons and, and administrative reasons, but then also your content and how you evaluate what's going on there. Thanks, Lisa. Anybody else have any comments to share about whether they've ever received some feedback that you may have agreed with, you may not have, um, about something that you wanted to offer and uh, we're told, no, 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 it's uh, it's not long enough and or, you know, it's it's not impacting enough people. Okay, so my take on this um, is that certainly under the skills for success umbrella is that it's still relatively new, right? The whole idea of workplace literacy, I have mentioned before, it cycles around about every decade, short lived, and then the government stops investing in it. But who knows, maybe now workplace literacy is going to have a longer duration, which would be great, uh, kind of prevents us from doing all the stopping and starting and stopping and starting. So. I think that we need to take our cues from employers, right? So if an employer says, I only have two weeks, um, three hours a week, that's all I can do. I say, take it and let's see what we learn from that, right? I, I think people can learn in as little as six hours. The question becomes, what are they learning, right? Are you able to change somebody from, you know, or support somebody and moving from a grade three level to a grade nine level? No, can't do that right? But what can you do? And how can you evaluate it so that you can demonstrate that you did it? So Lisa, your example was very um, apropos, right? Because you had to find a way to show that there was value in what you were delivering. Uh, one thing that I noticed is that uh, typically um, workplace literacy involves smaller groups of learners, like 10 to 15 people. But again, that's not a hard and fast rule. I mean, I've seen workplace literacy happen one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I've seen it happen in larger groups, you know, only maybe as many as, you know, 20 or 30. Uh, Lisa, do you have a question or comment? I do actually, just a quick add on to that, because uh, sometimes you're moving the needle in such very, very small increments that it's very difficult to actually show that improvement uh, over a short period of time with a small cohort. But if you start collecting that data across every single cohort that you run, whether it's the same programming in-house versus programming that you're offering with an employer. If you've got some metrics where you can now start collecting, let's say three years worth of information, that's the rationale to show that it might not be moving much, but we are moving the needle and by and large, you know, not just confidence and self-perceived um, uh, improvement is happening, but that you know, when we compare this response on a scenario, at the beginning of the program to this response at the end, 70% of participants move one, one tiny notch. One notch isn't enough for one cohort 
for your ETC to stand up and give you a round of applause. <laughs> but you know, when you have 300 people who have then been through this short-term program and 300 people times 70% have moved one notch, those end up being big numbers. And unfortunately with something new like this, like you say, we don't have a lot of data to support that what we're doing is good. And so what I would say is, having this kind of evaluation that we can share between us as programs and having even small pieces of evaluation that I can rely on to provide to Susan, for example, or Anne-Marie's got something from a program that she's been using where I can say, these programs demonstrate this kind of improvement. It's not our program, but we're gonna be asking the same questions because all of those questions are important we as a community of practitioners can actually build on the data that we're collecting. So I'd like to see something that's shareable, even if it's one metric that shows that there's some improvement, albeit a very, very small one that we can leverage between us. Well, that's a really, really good idea, Lisa. I mean, even, I mean, the notion of sharing information isn't new, but an official sort of provincial community of practice is new. And I think up until this point, we've been thinking about, you know, how do we market it and how do we, you know, do an organizational needs assessment, but now we're moving through as we get to the end of a natural cycle. Yeah, absolutely. We should not just be sharing evaluation tools, but the results of those evaluations, because cumulatively across a province, you start to get a picture a lot faster than you would within an individual program or even within a, a you know, a certain geographical area like a county or a city. So I love that idea and I'll have to do some thinking about that. Uh, Audrey. Sorry, I'm on my phone on not a good stand. So, um, um, uh, I feel uh, just I just want to go back to the point around um, what was it called self evaluation as uh, perspective based and therefore not as uh, uh, valuable as supposedly objective approaches to evaluation. Uh, and, you know, any of those sort of, you know, um, uh, claim to be, you know, non-biased, objective-based evaluation that can be replicated, you know, um, you know, to me, that's full of red flags, particularly in basic skills type of training. Uh, what's most powerful is actually um, using uh, self-reporting so that individuals, the workers who took the training uh, can uh, expressed their notice changes and the way they are feeling at work, their performance at work, and all of the different ways. So again, I feel so strongly that we need to be pushing strongly for self-reporting as a valuable, uh, not reliable in the scientific uh, quantitative type of, I mean, this is qualitative uh, based evaluation qualitative research. It's got a long history of being uh, authentic, relative, and valuable. And so I feel really strongly that we shouldn't be looking for tools and devices to do that broad scope because, as Lisa pointed out, um, you can't get the results that um, show enough change. Basically, it's totally disempowering for workers. And again, I feel like, um, you know, terminology and, and the uh, vocabulary of, of, you know, the sector in a way can disregard uh, workers' knowledge. But if they're supported to be able to build their vocabulary and be able to articulate um, the changes that they see in themselves, both in the behavioral, doing the tasks, and also in the self-concept and awareness of themselves. And to me, the critical skill is problem solving, whether it's in digital problem solving, working with teams problem solving, um, you know, meeting deadline problem solving. I think supporting people to be able to see that no, it's not about achieving a, a um, fake level 
to be blunt. It's actually um, how people know themselves more in the role as the worker. And so self-reporting to me is the most critical approach and evaluation. And I think in our field, in LBS, it should be the primary approach for evaluation. Thanks, Audrey. I was just writing something down there. How do you, sorry, did you say, how do you learn more about yourself as a worker? Is that what you said? How do you know yourself no. more as a lurker, as a worker, right? The whole, like, I guess, you know, I can't take off my um, structured inequality glasses because they're just there because if I feel like if I don't address that, then I'm not doing right by who I'm supposed to be working for. So, um, like, there's umpteen research. Uh, Suzanne Smythe at Simon Fraser University has done... Um, lots of uh, research in regards to people's sense of self. So in LBS, it's sense of self as a learner, but we need to take that over to sense of self as, as a worker. So it's not about being able to perform perfectly. It's being able to, I know that there may be more than one or two ways to solve this problem. And I have learned the capacity, I have learned the ability to figure out this way, then that way, then this way. So it's not based on that very narrow view of what literacy is. It's actually an embodied view of what being literate enough at work means. That's what we're looking for, right? Being literate enough. And so people need to kind of own that uh, themselves rather than it be an external measurement that's sort of put on people's head. Thank you very much. And, you know, I, I, I love that you're, you're certainly giving me a lot of food for thought. And again, I'm going to share that with some of the support orgs, because we need to try to figure out how to operational some of this operationalize some of this information for practitioners, right, who are bombarded like, with so many things, right, like just trying to understand what the OALCF is all about is a task, understanding some of these other things that, you know, the structure that we have to operate within and then figure out the structure that we wish we had and how do we get what we really want and need while still having, you know, um, well, continuing to get funded is a good thing, but, you know, definitely trying to move, move the needle in a way that makes sense as opposed to always trying to implement these workarounds. We're really good at that. LBS agencies should get a gold star for, for problem solving and having multiple ways to get to an endpoint. But it would be nice if we didn't have to do that, right? If we could just kind of call things what they are and do what we believe. Sorry, but I think based on that, um, like I see workarounds as a strength. I don't see it as oh, something else I need to do. Uh, so, for most employees who are at uh, the, the front line, most of them are, you know, who don't, don't have the big tickets in regards to education or qualified education. Um, that, that's their, that's a huge skill is to work around those sort of rigid structures in their workplace. So I feel like we should rethink workarounds as actually our strength and you know, I, I've been in this business for over 30, well, not over, for 30 years. And I know for sure that you cannot change policy. It'll be changed again. Sorry to say, I'm not saying don't fight it, but keep, keep fighting it. But don't expect things to actually shift to a learner-centered, person-centered approach. It's never going to. So we need to actually see our workarounds is our expertise and our skills and helping people to see the value of knowing how to work around is critical, I think, for people's employment. So I just wanted to just challenge that notion of, you know, darn, we have to work around again. Nah, this is the way that we actually excel and uh, serve uh, those workers slash learners the best. Good point. I think I was just sort of thinking how tiring that is <laughs> as someone who feels like they do it a lot. But uh, but yeah, point well taken. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I feel like what I want to do here is 
try to just encourage everybody to explore more than just this bottom left hand quadrant of literacy gains. You know, we get a lot of that. Um, you know, again, I think that's kind of what some of our reporting systems, if I can profess to know what they might be based on, um, would actually be based on, right? So I do encourage uh, everybody to think about other dimensions of evaluation. So certainly how learners um, think about literacy and how they think about themselves, I think is worthy of tracking. And again, it should be based on, you know, the intervention that you're offering, right? Like maybe as you mentioned earlier, Alicia, like a three hour workshop on, on Microsoft Teams, right? Like, I don't know if you'll have enough time, but I mean, this would be something worth exploring to see if you're making an impact in that area, right? Um, how do they feel about their own literacy practices? Are they self-reflecting at all on their own practices? And are they thinking about any, this is not so much about the plans that learners have that may involve literacy use. It's not about offering somebody a session and then immediately jumping on them and saying, well, what's next? You know, what do you do next, right? This is more about how they see, you know, literacy impacting the plans that they make, okay? so. I, I think that these are some other very interesting uh, dimensions, and I drew them from uh, an actual article called Evaluation of Workplace Literacy Programs, A Profile of Effective Instructional Practices. Again, it's only one article, pretty long one, but only one article. And I found it really interesting because it talks about some of the limitations of different kinds of evaluation strategies, right? And how far you can extrapolate some of the results. But I love the fact that I felt it was coming at it from a more holistic way or from a more holistic direction where it wasn't just about how many more things can you do because you took that training. And the other thing that I found really interesting about this article was that they were saying it needs to be intentional, right? So if you want people to think differently about, you know, literacy and themselves or about, you know, what their actual literacy practices are or about planning, you have to build time for that into the actual um, instruction, right? It can't be like one conversation or a passing comment. It has to be something that you are intentionally building into curriculum. Okay, and I, I realized that we could probably spend an entire session about that, but that was a little bit of an epiphany for me, right? We tend to think about learning activity, learning activity, learning activity, demonstrate your learning, and there we go, right? But this was kind of making me think, okay, so when you're developing curriculum, how do you build in discussion time for this? And how do you build in discussion time for that and make it really deliberate? And just to go back to one of the earlier slides, we were talking about the use of authentic workplace materials. I mean, the recommendation was at least 20 to 30% of the time, right? To, to really maximize some of that transfer, transferability of learning and applicability. Samira, if I can just interrupt, we've had a request for that article. So if you can tell me the name of that again, I'll research it and put it in the link. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, absolutely. I will pass across my piece of paper so you can do that in a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> we sit really <laughs> close together. <laughs> Okay, so I mean this study addressed two general questions. Basically, are learners in workplace literacy classes able to demonstrate gains between pre and post measures in areas related to practices, processes, ability, belief, and plans? Um, and for learner gains to occur, how much of several instructional practices like reading and writing practice, use of workplace examples, discussion of literacy processes, uh, discussion of literacy self-efficacy and discussion of future plans the classes need to incorporate. And again, I'm not holding this up as the only way to develop and deliver a workplace you know, literacy program, but I found it interesting uh, food for thought, right? And even if you only take away one or two things you know, from that particular article, I think that's good learning. You know, we have to take things in, in small steps. Well, I do, so. Okay, so here's an example. Um, a large workplace literacy program set out to learn. Um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I just did that one. Yeah. So that's those are essentially the two questions that they wanted to address in this evaluation uh, that I was referring to. And some of the the key learnings that came out of it. So they recommended. So we have to move this screen again. 
So to look at learner gains, um, they looked at a combination of 20 to 30 minute uh, structured interviews that they used across sites. And they looked at custom design workplace reading scenarios. So we talked about that a little bit uh, earlier. They did have a standardized structured interview and they had for each workplace their own specific um, workplace reading scenario. So we do talk about the use of authentic documents and this is an area where you can certainly pull them in. When it comes to literacy practices, they would ask questions like, tell me the sorts of things you read, you read and write on the job during a normal week and always asking for more examples. Um, thankfully, this is something that LBS practitioners are really good at, you know, not just sort of getting um, a one word answer and, and, and dropping it. You may need to really try to pull out some of these examples from participants. But this is just an example of how you can get at that question of literacy practices. Under planning, learners are asked to describe how good they saw themselves to be at reading and writing, or sorry, this is self-efficacy. So, you know, how good are you at, you know, reading and writing? And again, using those probes. So what are some specific examples and basis for beliefs that they have about their personal literacy effectiveness? and then plans. Now I'd like to ask you about your plans. Explain how you see reading and education as part of these plans and what plans might you have for next year. So I really like the explain how you see reading and education as part of your plans. So kind of linking um, sort of what they're learning about to their own future. You know, it doesn't mean that they have to run off to post-secondary or anything like that, but it's kind of encouraging that ongoing self-growth and continuous learning and really helping people to deliberately think about that. So why bother including other dimensions? Uh, again, you know, recognizing that it's not like most LBS instructors are wondering what else they can add into their day, but these were a couple of things that this study found. So learners who had discussion of literacy beliefs and plans as a deliberate part of their course had gains on the reading scenarios that were nearly three times that of the other learners, right? So it really seems as though this makes a difference, right? And learners who had discussion of literacy beliefs and plans as a part of their course made significant gains in the area of beliefs and perceived self-efficacy in relation to literacy, but the other learners did not. Okay, we don't often have the opportunity, the know-how, the luxury to be able to do these kinds of studies. So whenever I see a study that comes up with something like this, recognizing that it's only one example, I try to think about what that means for um, our own practices and how we seek to evaluate the impact of some of the work that we're doing. Some other uh, learning, we already talked about the first one. You know, you could consider a mix of common instruments or standardized instruments and customized instruments. To evaluate changes in literacy practice, you actually need a large dose. So what I mean by that is um, the only, they had, what they found in their workplace literacy programs, which of course were quite varied, they could only really see changes in literacy practice when they offer 200 hours of instruction. Okay, which doesn't mean that they didn't see really good changes in the other dimensions, but it does mean, again, as we talked about, that if you offer a five hour, 10 hour program, you may not be able to see changes in literacy practice, right? Whereas, um, you know, if you offer longer term programming, then you might. So my thinking is don't set yourself up for potential failure right or perceived failure because you always know that the learning that you're offering is making changes it's trying to figure out what changes you might reasonably expect to see given the length of programming that you're offering so we talked about using workplace materials in the classroom 20 to 30 percent of the time promotes increased comprehension and increased educational planning among learners and providing feedback and talking about learners' beliefs and plans appears to produce changes in learner attitudes or self-efficacy, which kind of makes sense, right? If you're talking about learners' beliefs, their plans, it's about them. It's about where they're going, why they might want to go there. And lastly, classroom discussion and feedback related to reading and writing processes seem to affect learner gains in answering comprehension questions and forming detailed educational plans. So. 
again, I'm not an instructor. I haven't been an instructor in many, many years. So, you know, I just thought that this really jumped out at me because often we look at just that one end game and maybe I'm just talking about myself, but I don't often see a lot of evaluation results that speak to these other dimensions of learning. And I think some of them are worth including. Okay, so if you want to have an impact on improved literacy processes and performance, the course should include a large proportion of time for learners to practice reading and writing. And they suggest about 70 to 80% of the time and a lot of workplace examples. So they're also suggesting that they want to see a plan discussion of learners' beliefs and plans. And if you put those together, uh, then you should see some really good gains in reading abilities and in learner beliefs about their own literacy effectiveness. And again, for longer running courses, like 200 plus hours, changes in learners everyday literacy practices may also be expected. So you may have done other evaluations and come up with other results, and I totally respect that, but this is what came out of this particular one. So to try to summarize here, um, <laughs> It's all about variety, right? I mean, sometimes it's irritating that there is no one way of doing things because we all have to kind of find our own way. But, you know, all different, all workplace literacy programs um, are a little bit different from each other, right? So expecting that there's only one way to approach evaluating them or documenting success from them is, is probably a little naive. I do agree with you, Lisa, though, that it'd be great if we could come up with a couple of core questions that no matter what kind of workplace literacy program you were delivering, you could derive some information and then we could start to try to track that. That'd be a pretty tall undertaking, but try to track that um, you know, across a larger geographical area. We talked that there are, you know, no, there are no perfect templates, at least not that I'm aware of. If you have one, then I would love it if you would, and I don't mean this facetiously, but if you could share it with me, I'd love to include it as part of our community of practice because we're all trying to learn as we go. Uh, lots of different audiences for um, evaluation and evaluation results. And there are lots of potential benefits, right, to, um, to uh, employees and to different audiences and also theories of change that you can implement. I'm asking you to consider moving beyond the skills gain dimension if you haven't already, and to be deliberate about it, and to scale your evaluations as appropriate for the intervention. I feel like this is a caveat that we've had throughout the four webinars that we put together, but the reality is that, um, you know, you only have so much time. So really trying to be specific about what information you really wanna know about what you're offering, um, you know, I, I think you really want to drill down on that. And last but not least, it's important just to keep learning as we go, right? I mean, there have been, there's a lot going on in the adult literacy field. And I think we recognize that being able to offer adult literacy programming in workplaces may actually make uh, upgrading accessible to people who would not otherwise be able to find the time to participate. Oh, Lisa, I think I see your hand up. Um, in asking some of these questions that might not necessarily show uh, demonstrate skills gains within our own programs necessarily, linking what you are asking with questions that are being asked in other parts of literacy can often be a good fit as well. So, for example, if you're going to be focusing on uh, your beliefs around education and skills upgrading, one of the things that we found really helpful was to find out from parents if in a very short period of time we were able to um, have them really think about their role in their children's education and whether that shifted because that shifted quickly and then research that comes from family literacy really demonstrated with long 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 um, trajectories that a parent's belief in the value of liter of their own literacy and how that impacted a child's ultimate education over a 20 year span. That research was also a big part of it. So you, if when you're designing your evaluation questions, you don't just have to look at the 
quantitative gains that a, that a student would make, but you can make these linkages and they're not perfect. You know, someone who's got a PhD in, you know, in research is, is going to rip that apart, but there's no reason to think that when we ask someone whether or not their value of their own education has improved over the five or 10 hours that we spent with them and that their capability as someone who is an adult learner um, has improved what that means for their children's education. Um, there, there are some linkages that we can make there. And, and it's not necessarily causality, um, but there are some interesting links that we can make. And if we're going to be looking at qualitative um, evaluation to support what we're doing with our programs, it opens the door for these kinds of questions for us to be asking. So don't focus so much necessarily on um, the workplace stuff when you're designing your evaluation. Look at where it touches other parts of the community and, and other values that, um, that might be supported by what you're providing. That's a great idea, um, Lisa, because I, I like it on two fronts. One, you know, if you have the opportunity to read other bodies of research, then I love the idea of looking for reasonable relationships between what we're doing and what that research suggests. And I also think that, you know, we may be able to, I don't know, instead of somebody, oh, I have to take this thing at work, right? I mean, if you ask them a question about how what they're doing might impact, you know, their thoughts about education or their children's education, then I think that you're kind of opening opening a door there, right? And maybe they will start to see more value in what they're doing because they never thought about that before, right? Because it's again, some of the stuff might seem like common sense. And of course, everybody thinks about that, but you don't, right? As parents, you're, you know, you're just trying to get through each day and not make too large of a mistake. And, you know, so you may not be thinking about how how that all works so i really like those ideas lisa that's cool there's also there's lots of evaluation tools as well out there that are are not that i'm a huge advocate for um the way mental health is measured in this country uh nor would i necessarily subscribe to the fact that uh we have a perfect mental health system in the way it's delivered and the way we look at those things and then it doesn't have its underlying biases that being said there are tools out there that are recognized and that um, have been validated and even integrating one or two questions from those standardized tools into our programs where the, again, you don't wanna measure stuff that you don't care about and that, that isn't relevant and you can't do anything with. But what if, if you have two questions from a mental health survey that you could actually be asking um, with regard to your program, and you can look at how improvement changes for your learners, given those two metrics, and how it improves for someone who is in another type of programming. Again, mm -hmm. you can start to make some connections between what it is that we're doing, both from a skill development and the human development um, prospect with these, these programs, because both of those things are important. Um, and in literacy, we, we have really had to kind of work with the evaluation tools that we've been given, which have been really, really prescribed. And in a lot of cases, don't measure what we even want to know about our own programs, right? So don't think that you have to recreate the wheel. There are tools out there that you can piggyback on, and it gives you the value then of a longer trajectory of, of data collection. Um, so you can get you can get pretty choosy about those things as well. So again, that, that sharing piece can be can be pretty important. Okay, thank you very much for that, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Huh. Well, um, are there any other questions or comments that people would like to share about today? Well, this webinar, I guess, in particular. Um, Amory, I just uh, I just wanted to say that I'm really appreciating this this really healthy conversation that we're having and. Um, to look at the person as a more sort of in a more global way than just a, as they are in their workplace. And I see that the workplace literacy uh, initiatives are a real opportunity for us to start talking to the employer about that as well. Um, and in their world, we can tie it back to retention. So uh, we've often said we do have one employer who has a motto that says that they want their employees to live their best life. And when we tell other employers that, you see a real aha moment in their eyes and then it opens the door for us to be able to talk about other kind of LBS 
um, uh, programs that can help with that and to show them the value of, you know, paying attention to the needs of your employee outside of the workplace makes them a healthier and happier employer, uh, employee in the workplace. So we've had some really good sort of uptake on some additional programs, and this is in addressing some of the, the mental health issues and things that we've been talking about. But when we talk about financial literacy and digital literacy, even though you're not using digital literacy at work, how it helps people at home. So we have been trying to make that connection between home life and work life. And, uh, and I think this is really sort of sparked some really great ideas for me on how to continue down that road. And I see that people are leaving. So I just want to make sure um, Jeremy and my colleague will be posting the evaluation. Uh, <laughs> you know, ironically, of course, we have to evaluate this. So I would really appreciate if before we close out the room that if you click on that link, it should probably open up in a different window. Uh, and if you have an opportunity to give feedback about today's session, we would appreciate it. Thanks, Amory, for, for that reminder. Um, yeah, I appreciate that everybody uh, took the time today to, to join us for the final webinar. You know, when I was trying to prepare for this, I started back in, I think it was July or August, and I was surprised that I really couldn't find a lot of literature. Now, I admit that I am not an academic, um, and, you know, uh, I don't have access to some of the articles, I suppose, that are, I'm sure, out there somewhere. Um, but the fact is for folks who are just kind of working in the field like we are and trying to do um, a darn good job of what we're trying to do, I didn't find a whole lot of information on workplace literacy in general and even less on evaluation, right? So it's a little concerning, but it's also in my mind an opportunity, right? It's not like there's been a ton of work uh, done in this area before that we now have to follow. It means that we can do more to create our own path. So. Um, I'm not giving up on policy. I'm sure I never will. Um, and the day that I do will be the day that I exit because uh, <laughs> I just have to believe that I can affect change. Um, although, okay, admittedly, maybe not at the policy level, but I'm still going to keep pushing these things up the pipe. And in the meantime, um, our goal is to support you guys as you're doing this, this very important work. So I have a couple of really good takeaways today, and I appreciate that you guys added to my knowledge um, very much. Uh, Amory, do you have one last comment or several? I actually, just have a, there was some uh, chat going on. People are asking for the recording of this session. They'd like to go back and watch it again. And to my knowledge, I think we're, we're, we're um, posting these online currently once we get them all packaged up. And is it in the LBS discussion and forum section that we're putting these? Um, uh, that's a very good question. I think Robin, um, Robin's got the, the workplace literacy thing. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Actually, there's um, there's a public facing page for all of the work around skills for success that is happening uh, this year. She's definitely putting it there. I'm going to put them in um, the workplace literacy community of practice. Anyway, um, we'll find a better place to put them so that it's more. Ugh. You know what? I'm definitely going to ask her to put it in the LBS resources forum. Does everybody okay. know where that is? Or how to get at it? If you don't, email us. Sorry, I hear an echo. Um, oh, Amber, are you me. still? Yeah, okay. Um, only one of us can speak in the office at any one time on a webinar. Um, so if you don't know where to find that, then I'm going to, uh, Jeremy, would you put my uh, email in the chat for me? Because can't do more than one thing at one time. So right now I'm writing down uh, Audrey's email address because yeah, I very much appreciate what everybody has said today. We will make sure that the um, all of the recordings are A, together and B, promoted throughout all the regional networks. So you can expect to get um, that information from your regional network. And if by some fluke it falls through the crack, my email is in the chat. Email me directly and I'll make sure that you get the links, okay? And I saw that Linda left already and some of the other folks did too, but the follow-up to this is a community of practice session, ironically, right? So we've had a conversation. I put together a couple of activities. Um, what 
history has shown us is that you don't always have time to do quote unquote homework, but I'd like to at least send out the activities that I put together for you. The follow up session is going to be on February 21st. Um, and I will send out information to every registrant for today's session with a link and with materials for that session. And again, our idea behind this whole community of practice thing was that there are so many webinars out there, right? And you get on and you get energized and you feel excited about, you know, the people that you're working with and maybe a couple of pieces of new information, but then it kind of filters away and then you take another webinar on something different next week. So we just thought, well, maybe we could come back to this, circle back to it and try to just immerse ourselves a little bit more in this particular topic. So that's the goal. If you don't do your homework, you're not gonna get kicked out. Um, it's just gonna be a matter of let's keep talking, let's keep sharing. And I hope you'll be able to join us for that session on February 21st. Okay. All right, well, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, again, I appreciate your time and your enthusiasm and above all your knowledge. And I look forward to seeing you soon.